Thanks for everyone who tuned in for video one and two. Stoked to see the excitement. If you haven't seen video one or two yet, I'll link it in the card above and in the description below. Again, we're talking about becoming a fully independent music artist that can finish amazing sounding music that they love with a system that allows you to finish better music faster by working less in the studio. Before we start, let me highlight Matt French's story after we started working together. He hadn't made music and hadn't touched a DAW for 17 years. He used to make music way back in the day and then life got in the way, other things became a priority and he didn't touch a DAW for 17 years. And then once we started working together shortly thereafter, he wrote, composed, produced, mixed and mastered a whole record that he did himself. Making him a completely independent artist sounded amazing and just from getting a few tweaks together in his process and his methodology and off to the races. He actually just released a brand new single where he did everything himself. I'll drop a link in the description down below. He also works part-time as a freelancer in a legit studio. This is what's possible when you dial in a streamlined process like workflow wizardry. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions over this past week, but to be honest, there wasn't a single one that I haven't heard before. Quite a while ago, I started a Facebook group and I asked every new member this question. What are you struggling most with right now with your music? That group has now grown to 5,000 people and I got about 3,500 to 3,600 responses to that question. I've heard it all. <laughs> now, there was a lot of different ways that folks articulated their problems, so I decided to make general categories in order to simplify it. Here are the categories in order of popularity. Where to start, mixing and mastering, everything in general, finishing music, arrangement and composition, marketing and promotion, music theory, learning the DAW, writing melodies, hooks, parts, sound design, finding good education, time, inspiration, motivation, improving quality, finding my sound. I'm assuming if you're watching this that you aren't just starting out, but if you are, I invite you to join my free school community where I'll be creating free resources to cover all the music production foundations you need. For those of you who are more experienced, the number one category is mixing and mastering. And the number one question that I get by far is the following. How do I get that pro sound? Since this is the most popular question, and since it's the last step that we need to get your music past the finish line and to the rest of the world, that's exactly what we'll cover in this video. Let me break down what it actually takes to get that pro sound. Let's start with number one. Mixing is not the answer. Most people drastically overestimate the importance of the mixing stage in the production process. Yes, it's important, and yes, there's lots to learn, but it's actually not the biggest factor in getting that pro sound. If you talk to any professional mixing engineer and get your hands on some professionally recorded stems, you'll quickly find out the truth. 80 to 85% of the mix is done before they start mixing. Before touching a single fader or loading a single EQ, the production sounds really good. The tall tale sign of an amateur producer is that they tell themselves, oh, I'll just fix it in the mix. The purpose of a mix isn't to make your track sound good. The purpose is to make a production that already sounds good sound great. So what makes something sound good? Number one is what we've already covered in a previous video, an amazing composition. A song that's been carefully structured, has awesome parts and performances, and is well arranged will make mixing a hundred times easier. For example, if you have competing low end with busy bass guitar parts and a ton of low end riffs on the piano, it's going to be hard to mix just from an arrangement standpoint. So that's a composition problem. Number two is the production stage, which is what we'll cover next. So let's go over the prerequisites for what makes a pro mix. So before you start to mix your composition, it's crucial to do a quality control check first. Remember, we want to get our production to sound 80 to 85% of the way there before we start mixing. In order to do that, we can reference what I like to call the hierarchy of quality. You want to keep in mind what's most important when it comes to the quality of your music, and I break it down as follows. At the top, we have songwriting and composition, which we've already covered is the most important thing by far. Under that, we have performance, which is the expressivity, the feel, the humanness of your performances. Under that, we have your sound source, which is the quality of your samples, the quality of your instruments, of your recordings, etc. Under that, we have processing. And then finally, at the bottom, we have gear. 
With this hierarchy in mind, I usually focus on the top three, just by the way, the single best piece of advice I can give you for this stage is to train yourself to identify problems instead of implementing random solutions. So what do I mean by this? Often, we automatically think in terms of solutions when we're brainstorming. It could be something like, I could add a harmony to the main melody, I could automate parameters on the synth, I could play with a delay on the vocals, which are all great ideas, but what problem are they solving? If you don't identify sonic problems within your production, it can lead you to making your production sound different, but not necessarily better. Why is that? Because problems are finite while solutions are infinite. That's why at this stage of the process, I encourage that everybody focuses on the problems because then you'll have a clear pathway to finalize your productions. This makes it extremely simple to know when you're done because in theory, you could tweak and modify and refine something forever, but at some point we gotta call it good enough to move forward. So how do you know where that line is? It's simply when there are no more problems to fix. So here's a few questions you could ask yourself to identify problems. Under the umbrella of performance, are they well-performed and tightly edited, or does something need to be redone? In terms of parts, are all of your parts working together? Is there enough space? Is there too much space? Are they dynamic enough? Under the umbrella of sounds, do any samples need to be replaced? Does something need to be re-recorded with a different tone? Under melody and harmony, is everything working together harmonically? Do your melodies lead the ear naturally? Underneath rhythm, we could look at is everything in time and grooving together? Does something need to be a little bit more tightly edited or velocities changed to increase the dynamicism and the groove of your rhythm? This is exactly what we cover in stage five of the system. Number three is what I like to call 5D mixing. So this is assuming that you've got a great composition and a problem-free production. Then we can move on to the almighty mix, which is the last 10 to 15%. Now, there's a fair bit to learn within mixing, which is way more than I can cover right now, but it often gets overcomplicated. The purpose of mixing is to enhance what makes your composition and production awesome. It's not about the mix, it's about the song. So assuming you know your mixing foundations, such as Sound Theory 101, signal routing, and audio processors, such as EQ compression saturation, this is how I simplify the mixing process. And just by the way, if you don't have those yet, I highly encourage you to join my free school community where I will be breaking down all of that foundational knowledge in depth so you can get those foundations rock solid. So here are the dimensions that you play with while mixing, and I break it down with the acronym VISTA. So it's easy to remember because we're creating this magical VISTA of sound, right? The first dimension is volume and frequency combined, which is by far the most important of all the dimensions to get down. If you can master hearing and manipulating frequency and dynamics with EQ, compression, and volume, this is the 80% of being a mixing engineer. And I also see this as the height of a mix because we tend to perceive higher frequencies as being higher than lower frequencies. The second dimension is what I call image, which is simply understanding the stereo image and panning your elements from left to right, which obviously gives you the width of your mix. The third dimension I call space, which is reverb and reflectivity. And again, this gives our sounds depth because something that sounds far away will have more reverb and less high end, and something that's close to in your face will barely have any reverb at all. And this will create a sense of depth when we contrast those different elements. The fourth dimension is time. And this is essentially the first three dimensions changing over time using automation, right? Because you can change the depth of something over time. You can bring something that's in the background forward. You can EQ things differently for different sections of your song, et cetera. And then the fifth dimension is what I call aesthetic. Okay, and this is the reason why you're manipulating all the other four dimensions for some sort of artistic reason, right? Which is the purpose of your moves. And the more and more you practice using the tools and getting mixes done, the more you'll start to develop your ear and your methodology as an artist, as a mixing artist, because it is equally a balance of science and art, but by far we wanna prioritize the art of the mix. And then once you get higher and higher level with those mixing skills, at a certain point, you always want to be framing your decisions with why am I doing this, right? And usually it's to solve a specific problem and or to create 
some sort of aesthetic response. From there, I walk through these seven steps to take a mix from A to Z, which is seven steps in total. Number one is organizing your session, which is simply cleaning up any tracks that you don't need. You might wanna bounce down all of your MIDI down to audio, group your tracks, color, code your tracks, and name your tracks. Step two is setting up your routing. If you're in a fancy studio and you have outboard gear, you're gonna to wanna to set up all that routing ahead of time. But in the DAW, you wanna set up your return tracks, any go-to effects that you put on your tracks, such as EQ compressors on your groups, et cetera, and set that up all ahead of time so that when you start mixing, you can immediately get into flow without getting stuck with all of the technical setup stuff. Step number three is to balance levels, which I also call a rough mix, where you're only getting a mix done using volume and panning, and that is it, right? You're just listening to it, bringing up your faders one at a time, and then at that point, you're just getting something to sound pretty solid and clear, just using those tools. And then from there, you're gonna gain a lot of information as to what your mix needs to be finalized. And then step four is to process your track. So this is applying EQ, compression, saturation, parallel processing, fancy processing, whatever needs to be done in order to get your mix where it has to go. And then from there, step five is automation. So I take some time to play around with that fourth dimension, right? To change things over time. You might wanna duck down the vocals and the verse. Maybe you wanna increase the volume of your master and the choruses and change things over time. And then step six is to zoom out and look from like a bigger perspective on your mix if there's any room for special effects, right? So maybe it's a specific delay on a vocal syllable. Maybe you want to automate the EQ of something to give a special effect. Maybe you want to put in a riser or drop to enhance a transition, anything like that. And then finally, step seven is to reference and finalize. And this is where I bring in other masters and other mixes to my session to evaluate the differences frequency-wise between those references and my mix. And then I do a few things to make sure to prepare my mix for mastering before I decide to finalize that mix. And this is exactly what we cover in stage six of the Workflow Wizardry system. Next week, I'm gonna publish a brand new masterclass that's going to have a super exciting limited time offer for you if you're ready to take this to the next level. Let me know your number one insight from today's video in the comments down below and let me know if you have any questions about what we covered so far. And hey, join the school community if you want to interact before all the exciting stuff drops next week. And with that said, I will see you in that next video.